I felt the boundaries of my body falling away. I felt my body merging in that moment with everything. And at the same time, I felt my individual awareness collapsing to a point on the fretboard, becoming one with the fretboard and with my moving fingers on the fretboard. And then uh, I guess a second later, it just expanded. It kind of exploded. And then everything kind of went silent for I don't know how long, but it was this deep experience. And when I came back, so to speak, into my individual awareness, into John, it was different. Seeing the world was different because I now had this perspective of infinity collapsing to a point and then expanding back to infinity, the mechanics of creation. And having had that experience, nothing was quite the same. Everything I looked at felt different. I could feel it inside of me more. Welcome to Letting Go and the Greatest Secret, where we explore the end of your suffering and the beginning of lasting happiness. I'm Hale Dwoskin, and today I'll be joined by John Rotz. John Rotz is the founder and principal of Visioneering Group, a transformational marketing and public relations agency linking spirit, vision, and holistic values with compassionate communication to promote a positive and sustainable future. He is also the founder of the Global Alliance for Transformational Entertainment. John has been on the spiritual path since 1967. Well, as far as where to start, uh, that's always a conundrum for me. I know. <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure whether I start yesterday or, you know, Almost 70 years ago. I, I <laughs> yeah, well, it doesn't really matter if you work backwards or work forwards. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess we all wind up in the same place anyway. That's true. Um, well, I, I guess what I, I'd like to maybe start with is because I have such a deep and uh, long term interest in entertainment, arts, and media. Yes. Uh, but not ordinary, but from a transformational or consciousness perspective. Yes. So very early in my life, around the age of 11, 12, I had some experiences that uh, were apparently to inform the rest of my life. Um, And at the time, I didn't know how to frame those experiences within myself or how to talk about them with parents or friends or teachers or clergy, whatever the case might be. Um, But as life would have it, um, I was led uh, along a a certain path, uh, which helped inform what those experiences apparently were. Um, But they also impacted me as far as uh, the direction my life would take, certainly personally, but also professionally. And um, so very early on, I recognized the power uh, of entertainment, arts, and media uh, in our lives and in the life of society and in the world. And I knew that I wanted to work in those fields, but again, from the standpoint of consciousness and transformation. Um, So I started, you know, again, as life would have it, I began you know, kind of following my inspiration or follow, following my bliss, as Joseph Campbell would say. And it led me in a very circuitous uh, route, um, traversing many, many different um, careers, if you will, in, in one. And though I didn't know it at the time, uh, in recent years, I have been able to look back, having some history uh, under my belt now, and I could see that, wow, all of these things were not disparate instances, but rather parts of a whole that was interconnected. And it was leading me in a particular direction. And I believe, uh, though I can't say with 100% certainty, I believe that kind of the apex of that was the founding of an organization, a nonprofit organization called GATE which is an acronym for Global Alliance for Transformational Entertainment. And our vision statement is creative artists 
transforming the world by transforming entertainment, arts, and media from within. The key phrase being from within. Yes. And we founded Gate uh, in 2009 at Fox Studios here in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. And my honorary co-founders at that time were author Eckhart Tolle and actor Jim Carrey. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's one of the centerpieces of my, my life right now. So can you tell me more about what Gate does and um, what it's about and how it's unfolding right now? Yes. So again, uh, it's been a very interesting path for Gate. Uh, when we first formed it, we were doing large events for two, three, four thousand people. We were doing smaller events for just several hundred people and even um, salon style events at Jim Carrey's home for, you know, 50, 60 people. Um, but Gate has evolved and emerged in a very different way now. Um, it, is, it is creative artist centric. Previously, uh, at the founding of Gate, we were, we were basically pushing the genre of transformational entertainment, transformational film. Mm -hmm. Um, in 1990, I was promoting a movie called Mindwalk based yes. on the work of Fritjof Capra. And uh, during the time of promoting that film, I was, I was, I was uh, leading a screening, an advanced screening at Dolby Labs in San Francisco. And my usual habit was to start a screening and then sit in the back for, you know, five, 10 minutes to make sure everybody was comfortable. Uh, this particular time, though, for whatever reason, I can't say, but I decided I'm going to watch it again with this audience, even though I'd seen it 50 times. <laughs> right. And as I was watching the audience, watching the movie, I began noticing that they were forming, the audience members were forming this relationship with the movie in ways that I had never seen before they were commenting to one another during the movie. They were elbowing each other and saying, see, that's the idea I was talking about. Oh, yeah. They were thrusting their fist into the air. They were letting out, you know, verbal uh, signs of approval of the movie, et cetera. And I, I watched this relationship unfold during the course of the movie. And at the end, when I uh, was leading the Q&A before starting the Q&A, um, I said, so it seems like all of you have had a very transformative experience and everybody, you know, rose to their feet and clapped. And, and in that moment, I knew this is a transformational film. And I coined that term transformational film later, uh, a few days later, transformational entertainment and have been using those terms ever since. And so, um, you know, Mind Walk was, it is an example of, of the type of film that Gate wanted to produce or, 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 or support the production of mm -hmm. through creating this genre. Rather like faith-based entertainment in the Christian domain, Yes, I saw transformational entertainment as its equivalent, but in a more inclusive, embracing, expanded sense of the term. Yes, yes. So, but, but to answer your question more directly, Gate is intended to be an organization that supports nurtures, helps heal, educates, et cetera, creative artists. Right now, artists are, are kind of um, at a loss oftentimes as to how to move their careers forward. Well, I come out of the entertainment business as a manager and an agent. So one of the founding tenets of Gate was simply, we wanna support in all the ways that we can creative artists. So we have about a hundred workshops that we're going to be doing. Uh, online, but also in person. Um, we have a jobs board where people can uh, look for jobs or post jobs. Um, we have various international events. Um, we will be doing our next uh, big gate event um, here in Los Angeles in 2022. We will also do our very first European gate event in Austria in 2022 uh, at Prince Alfred of Liechtenstein's Eco uh, World Peace Resort in Austria, um, our, our, what we wanna do, I mean, ultimately the vision is gate nation. Um, imagine a nation of creative artists transforming the world. And we want it to be its own economy where people support one another financially. Mm -hmm. We want it to be its own distribution platform. 
And we also have a part of Gate called GEM, uh, Gate Entertainment Media, where we intend to produce or co-produce projects, uh, which one of them right now is a film about the spiritual life of Henry Miller, the uh, author and, and uh, artist. Um, and it's a, in particular, it's about his time, his spiritual search in Esalen. I'm sorry, not Esalen, in Big Sur. I always use Esalen. In, in yeah, Sur. yeah. Yeah. So in Big Sur, his time there. And I, I, haven't, I haven't made this public yet. You have a scoop here. But we've just signed a director. And he's wonderful. Uh, and he, he produced the film Control about the uh, music group... Um, uh, I forget what the name of the music group is. <laughs> That's but, okay. But he's currently producing a film about the life of Jeff Buckley, uh, mm -hmm. whose father was Tim Buckley. And he's getting ready to produce uh, another uh, uh, do documentary about uh, Sinead O'Connor. And then our film is up after that. So cool. very excited about this, this growing team. That's wonderful. That's yeah. wonderful. And in your experience, you, you've been you're focused right now on creative artists and supporting them, but you've also met a lot of people in the industry in general. Is this trend to be both interested in the their own spiritual unfoldment and also supporting it, something that's widespread in, in the uh, entertainment industry? Yes. So I've noticed over many years, it actually for me started about 40 years ago when I first came to Los Angeles. And the first, the first people that I worked for um, was uh, Doug Henning, the magician, mm -hmm. uh, gave me kind of my very first job in Los Angeles, uh, followed by uh, actor Ned Beatty, who gave me my next job and I became his assistant. And then following that, I worked with a manager. Uh, named Dolores Robinson, and we managed Martin Sheen, LeVar Burton, uh, Emilio Estevez, Keenan Waynes, a whole bunch of people. But the interesting thing is that Doug and, and Ned were both uh, practitioners of Transcendental Meditation, um, <laughs> as was I, and I'm also a teacher of TM since 1976. And so I began noticing uh, that there were people like Merv Griffin and and Clint Eastwood and Mike Love of the Beach Boys and so many people practicing TM. And I thought, you know, this could potentially lead to a renaissance uh, in the entertainment uh, business. Yes. And um, at that point, Ned and I formed an organization that was actually the, um, you know, the, the uh, I guess, precursor to Gate um, called, uh, it's a pretentious sounding name, but it was here. <laughs> Um, it was called the Council for the Enlightenment of the Entertainment Industry. <laughs> and, uh, we, that's and, a mouthful. It is. <laughs> I'm, yeah. Yeah. That's another story. <laughs> but, um, you know, sometimes those big names are what you need to get something moving. That's true, Hale. That's absolutely true. Yeah. In fact, when, when you know, I, I didn't like sit down one day and say, oh, I'm going to think of an organization that does this and here's what its name is. No, I literally was. I was in a particular place and the word gate just popped into my head. And then it's, you know, Global Alliance for Transformational Entertainment and an early version of the vision statement, which simply was transforming the world by transforming entertainment and media, period. Um, and then it just popped into my head. And I said, oh, what is that? And I, I resisted it for quite some time. That happened in 2003. Um, even though the seeds of gate, I can trace back to 1967, again, looking back and, and seeing, oh, well, that is interconnected with this and this led to that and so on, you know, life leaves clues, right? It does. And, um, and, and so, uh, I, I thought, well, uh, I'm, I, you know, I don't know what to do with this because I think it's maybe ahead of its time. I'm not so sure how people in the entertainment business will take to it. Um, but I, I kept quiet until 2007, and that idea had emerged, and it kept kind of pushing on me, and I kept resisting it. And one day I was sitting with Eckhart Tolle, whom I'd been working with, and um, I said, Eckhart, you know, this, this idea 
uh, keeps pestering me and I keep pushing it away and I, may I share it with you? And he said, yes. So I did. And his uh, uh, advice to me was do it. And um, I said, okay, if I do it, uh, would you be an honorary co-founder and would you give a keynote address on consciousness and entertainment at the event uh, that we might have, the inauguration event? And he said, yes. And I had introduced Jim Carrey to Eckhart, um, you know, so, a little time before that. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to Jim and I said, hey, Eckhart and I are going to do this event and form this organization. Uh, would you be an honorary co-founder and, and co-host the event with me and maybe talk a little bit? Jim said yes. So I knew with Jim and Eckhart, people would maybe take my idea a little bit more seriously. Ah, yes, that's a good good start. <laughs> good start. And they did. And they did. And at our inauguration at Fox Studios, very first gate event, uh, we, we, we filled every single seat, 500 seats, standing room only. And they had to turn away almost 1,600 people. It yes. created a huge traffic jam out in front of Fox. And we have producers, actors, actresses, dis, di, excuse me, designers, musicians, um, pretty much every form of creative talent, you know, has been associated uh, with GATE. So very exciting. That is exciting. And so what is your, um, I know you're about to work on this movie, yeah. but w how has it transformed the industry uh, over this time? Have What have you seen? Yeah. Uh, because you've been at it for a while. Well, I mean, obviously, since age 11, <laughs> as you said, that, that's when everything started to unfold for you. But uh, have you, since the founding of Gates, uh, Gate, how, how have you seen it, things transform from that? Yes. And I would say even before the founding of Gate, I began noticing transformations. Yes. So I began noticing that people in entertainment, arts and media, were more open, started becoming more open to spiritual ideas, yes. to the notion of transformation, to the uh, possibility of, of working with a teacher or teachers, to going on retreats, to reading books, to having deeper conversations and so on. Yes. Um, but in, 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 the, in the entertainment world in particular, that was a, um, a kind of a hard uh, nut to swallow for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people kind of, uh, how shall I say, poo-pooed the idea of, of transforming entertainment. They didn't really understand what it meant in right. terms of entertainment content, in terms of relationships in the business, and so on. And so as I began explaining more and more uh, to people, even in the studio system, people grew more open to it and people began asking me to teach them meditation and they began noticing the benefits of learning meditation and practicing it. And they noticed how it started to impact their work. They noticed that the ideas they wanted to promote through films, in books, in music and so forth, um, were more on that level of transformation. Um, I also noticed that um, I've, I've worked on some 70 films over the years. What the Bleep Do We Know, Peaceful Warrior, Free Trip to Egypt, I Am, Mind Walk, Baraka, so many films. And I began noticing that the studio system and independent filmmakers started to take notice. And mostly independent filmmakers starting started to want to produce and direct those kinds of films, write those kinds of films. Yes. So I started noticing that. I started noticing that people um, in general were being affected, uh, you know, people who went to movies like What the Bleep Do We Know, where we had, you know, the team that, that created that movie, amazing team, just amazing people, uh, you know, Will Arntz and Betsy and, and, and Mark and, and so many people. And um, uh, as we started marketing it, and we would notice that in, in Arizona, for example, at the Harkins Theater chain, it played for like six, eight months straight in some of their theaters. And we would have lines just going, literally going around a whole block in theaters around the United States. So this was the impact. And I even noticed um, one of the gate events uh, that we produced, there was, I don't know, two, 3,000 people there at the Saban Theater in Beverly Hills. And I, I started feeling, Hale, that look, if, if I'm, if I'm, if, if gate is real, 
I have to be inclusive. And that means I need to invite somebody from the Christian community to speak at a gay event. Definitely, yeah. And I searched and I found somebody that I felt was my counterpart. And I called him and I said, hey, um, here's who I am. Here's what I'm doing. I want to invite you to participate in this. I explained to him what it was and, you know, kind of what the philosophy was. And, uh, you know, when when that in, the words of invitation came out of my mouth, I literally inside, I said, oh, God, what did I just do? Mm-hmm. And he told me later on that he had the same reaction when he said, yes, oh God, <laughs> what did I do? Yeah. but he came and he participated in the event. He was wonderfully received. He said some beautiful things. But what really moved me is after the event, um, he sent me an email, uh, and I wish I could read the quote to you, but it, it had to do with um, Gate was a special event. He felt that um, Christians, that his theology community could learn a lot from Gate and could be more like Gate, be more inclusive, more harmonious, um, and that he would like to keep the dialogue going. It really impacted him. Um, it's it's on our new gate site that will be going up soon. So that was another impact. And then the numbers of people uh, who've contacted me, uh, I would say almost on a weekly basis saying, hey, because of gate, because of a gate event or two we attended, we started this company, uh, we started this collaboration, we produced this, we produced that. So I can tangibly see that this orientation, in a sense, gave permission to people to undertake uh, a deeper exploration into entertainment arts and media. Yeah, well, it's, that's beautiful. And when you look at the world right now, it, it's, it's got one or two things going on. Uh, how do you see this impacting that? How, how, how can what, we, what we're doing, you know, we, I do it on a much smaller scale than you, but how, how do you think what we're doing can help that, that whole thing that's going on on the planet? Yeah. Well, I love that question. And I don't have a particular answer for it. I can say that I suppose we could consider that question on a few levels. Yes. Um, if we considered it on uh, the level of consciousness itself, what some people you know, a, a term they might use is non-duality, yes. then it's, it's an appear, all of these things are appearances that are happening and uh, we don't have, you know, much to say or do about it. <laughs> Probably um, not anything. <laughs> yeah. If we consider it on the level of physics, yes. uh, we can talk about this in terms of being a phase transition where human life, perhaps human DNA, is uh, morphing into a new configuration, a new form uh, that ultimately ultimately is leading us to a much, much higher uh, place of deep connection with one another. Um, And of course, there's the level of activism and there's the level of um, various philosophical theories. I guess it depends on who you're talking to and and, you know, what ground do you want to assume in that particular way? Sure. And do you sense something I'm sensing, not just with the community of the people who, who do our work, but, but, and the people I've been interviewing from many other like-minded communities, do, do you sense, despite the fact of on the surface there's all this turmoil, do you sense an underlying openness and interest in, in the inner harmony, the inner one, the inner, the inner um, light that is in every, each and every one of us, or is each and every one of us. Do you sense a greater openness? Absolutely. Uh, More, you know, again, both you and I have been doing this work and in this community for, you know, a very long time. And I think we can both track um, the changes that have taken place over the decades. But now something feels different. Even though uh, one could say there is cause or causes uh, to be concerned, certainly at the very least, um, and maybe even uh, sad, uh, disappointed, um, and so on, 
um, I feel very optimistic because I, you know, I have a core belief, which probably you and many of your listeners do. And that is that everything, everyone, everything is consciousness yes. fundamentally interacting with itself. Yes. And if that is true, and if we really believe it, then by default, we must see that everything that is happening, even though our mind may have its doubts and concerns and what have you, we must know that this too is good, so to speak. Yes, there yes. is something happening here of an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinarily evolutionary nature that it is leading us. And in my opinion, the best thing we can do is stay out of the way, which means cooperate with what is. Yes. Whatever is unfolding is unfolding, and we need to do our part to cooperate with it while maintaining that connection within, that deep connection and consciousness within. Yes, yes. The, the, the more we allow what is to be the way it is, we can also, uh, just by our willingness to allow what is to be, we often see things that other people wouldn't. Or we can lead people to seeing things that they wouldn't be able to see on their own. Yeah. And in doing that, I think it helps shift things in a positive direction. Lester Levinson, the man that you know, that inspired this work that I do, uh, used to say that this time, he used to predict that this time period would happen and there'd be a tremendous amount of external turmoil, yes. which we're seeing. But he thought that it was. An, an incredible invitation or an opportunity for us to stop looking away from, from ourselves to find ourselves. He, he said that the, this time period ruin is an invitation for us to make a U-turn back to you, yeah. not you, personal you, the, the, the artificial one that we all relate to. So, in dearly as though it's real, but the real you that is shared by all that is. Yeah. And, Beautiful. and I think I can, I, I think that's happening that, and it's not just happening in one community, it's happening planet planetarily, it feels like. Do you yeah. sense that too? I do. And, and to answer your previous question now in this context. So when I use the word artist or creative artist or maker um, or creator even, I use these words interchangeably. Mm -hmm. It means anyone who is a filmmaker, a musician, a singer, songwriter, actor, actress, poet, dancer, fine artist, anyone who uses the arts. And most artists, if they really explore within themselves, they know or they will realize that they create because they have no choice and that they are attempting to put uh, works of art in the world to make the world a better place. Yes. Um, there's a phrase I use that, you know, uh, um, creative works are structured in consciousness and are different in different states of consciousness. And this idea, this principle explains why we are drawn to the types of arts that we are drawn to uh, and why we may be repelled uh, you know, by certain types of art. Whereas for somebody else, it is uplifting to them. Um, but it's all rooted in consciousness. And in this regard, I believe that all works of art you know, come from that unmanifest, unbounded, infinite consciousness, I am, and they are, presented to the world to share with the world and artists are there to basically say you're looking over here but i'd like you to look over there or over here because you're missing something really important yes and that's yes. the great role of art and artists that is their job in the world um it's one of their jobs in the world so to speak yes. um and so i i think that um people who are um, and I hate to use the word consciously creating, but I'll use it because, you know, your audience <laughs> understands it. Um, but um, people who are consciously creating fine art or poetry or songs or films, they're doing so because they want to share a perspective and understanding ideas that they feel will be helpful to people. 
that they feel like even a film, you know, a film is a journey. It's a journey through of story that takes you from here to here. And to me, the best films embody a transformational viewpoint, humanistic values, and, and you know, really help people understand themselves more deeply if they choose to look at it that way and not simply just as a story. So that's the great value of entertainment arts and even media. And regarding media, uh, you know, people who, journalists, let's say, you know, they went to J school and they were taught a definition of news that encompasses, you know, 20 some values such as celebrity, novelty, um, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. There's about 20 values they use to define news. Uh -huh. And Gate has been promoting the idea that we need universal, humanistic, holistic values to help redefine what news is. We're not saying get rid of those other values, but add these values to it because it will make your coverage much more uh, appealing uh, to you know, the news stories, much more appealing to people because we're sharing the amazing things that are going on around the world, the amazing people, the amazing developments, the amazing organizations who truly are helping to transform the world. And that's the kind of news I want to hear and I would like other people to hear. Yes, yes. And you know, if you look at the end of even just the, the traditional 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30 news, yeah. they're, they're trying to go in this direction. I think they sense it. You yeah. can, you know, they, they try to end. It's not that always that transformational, but at least it's, it's stories of courage, stories of perseverance, stories of love and uh, sharing and compassion. Absolutely. And I think that's a wonderful trend. It's that a wonderful trend. And I and think it, it's positive. Yeah, very positive. And, you know, I can say, Hale, that over the last, you know, 20, 30 years, I've received proposals from many, many people, um, similar ideas of starting a, a, a TV network, um, of some kind of a channel, et cetera, that advocates for this positivity and news. And um, Gate, actually, one of Gate's projects is a project that examines uh, through acting skits. Oh, um, it condenses tw a 24 hour news cycle into an evening, about three hours, showing people what does a transformationally oriented financial news program look like? Well, it talks about socially responsible investing, among other topics. Yes, yes. It, it actually teaches people um, about financial literacy that most people don't really have, have not been educated with. Um, so let's teach people about how to invest and take care of yourselves financially. And then, you know, what, what are some of the other programs? Well, any kind of programming you would find on any particular network, you could find uh, in a transformational media network, um, but with that twist of, of transformation added. So yes. obviously health programs and the cooking programs might feature vegan and vegetarian uh, programming, et cetera. Um, and I don't want to get too... Um, crazy about, you know, the strictness of it all and, and, and sort of, you know, trying to push ideas on the people um, that may actually turn them off. Right. But I think there's room for a channel, certainly now with this type of program. No, I, I 100% agree with you. But, you know, before we, uh, we talk more about that, I wanted to circle back something about, you, you said about creation and, and artists. You know, I, I think the, again, the, the way I've experienced it is when I when I lead seminars, the or or whatever you want to call them, retreats, whatever the the speaking happens from a place of emptiness. There's no hail speaking, none, and that's the only way I know how to do it. And I think, and I I've done done art. I haven't done it in a long time, but when, when I did it in the past, when I drew or painted, it came from the same place. That if I was thinking about it, that that was nothing happened. But if yeah. if there if it if it was coming from that empty fullness that is 
what we all are ultimately. When it came from that, it had a resonance and a truth, but also that's transformational in the act. So I think that that artists are they are transforming the, the world as they transform themselves. And good art and good acting, and uh, well, that's an art too, but that's another example. They, it's coming from this place of this empty fullness. There's no thought to it. It's spontaneous. It's open. And it leaves the audience and the artist transformed. Would you agree with that? I couldn't have said it better. Oh, okay. And like you, I can't really prepare so much when I do a presentation, you know, yes. someplace. Um, I just trust that that will move in my place and say what needs to be said. Yes. And like probably you understand when I say that even now during this interview, because I don't know the questions that are going to come up. Um, I just trust that, you know, some answer will be there. Hopefully it's appropriate. Uh, and I'm listening to it as it's coming out. Um, yes, I am yes. Of that. Yes, yes. And I will say that that um, one experience I had when I was 11 years old and um, I, I was I was playing in rock bands from about 11 to 17. I was um, a, a, apparently some quite good on guitar. And so I was playing with guys who were. 19, 20, 21, and we were opening for national touring acts. And it was quite a, quite an interesting experience for an 11 year old. I'm sure. But, but leading up to that, um, I would sit in my bedroom at home and I was practicing and I would come home from school and I'd go in the bedroom and I would practice for hours, you know, and one experience that happened when I was practicing one day is, um, you know, I was sitting in the chair and I'm holding my guitar and I'm watching my fingers on the fretboard and watching the fretboard. And all of a sudden, I felt this sense of expansion overcoming me. I felt the boundaries of my body falling away. I felt my body merging in that moment with everything. Yes. And at the same time, I felt my individual awareness collapsing to a point on the fretboard, becoming one with the fretboard and with my moving fingers on the fretboard. And then in that same, and, and, um, uh, I guess a second later, it just expanded, it kind of exploded. And, and then everything kind of went silent for, I don't know how long, but it was this deep experience. And when I came back, so to speak, uh, into my individual awareness, into John, um, it was different. Seeing the world was different because I now had this perspective of infinity collapsing to a point and then expanding back to infinity, yes. the mechanics of creation. Yes, and yes. having had that experience, nothing was quite the same. Everything I looked at felt different. I could feel it inside of me more. Yes, yes. Yes, it, and those type of experiences are are becoming more and more common. Yes. Even with people who aren't consciously looking for truth. Yeah. Because I, I think they come from uh they come from that which we are. They they they're it's hard to put this into words, but it's it's the the illusion that we usually get locked into of thinking I'm real, you're real, this is all real, this is all solid, and I'm a person, you're a person, and we need to get something from each other, and or we need to protect ourselves from each other. Yes, is on one level is getting very exaggerated. Yes, on the very. planet, very exaggerated, <laughs> but at the same time, it's falling apart from the inside because it is an illusion. And because of that, there is this light that's shining through all form that I, I think uh, is just an invitation. Yeah. To, this is to, an important word that you use, invitation. Um, and and I, I suspect you kind of feel this way too. But, you know, um, at this stage in my life, um, everything to me is an invitation. Yes. And everything is worthy and deserving of my gratitude um, because uh, 
everything is extraordinary even even the weird stuff even the stuff that's causing us to like slightly panic or wonder what's going on again when we fall back into self and we experience that silent expanded version of the smaller limited self called john or hale when we have that experience we know everything is right everything <laughs> is as it should be and let's be grateful for this, the totality that is unfolding right now. Yes, yes. And also there is this spontaneous, unconditional love for everyone and everything exactly as it is, which is, which is, uh, I think, transformational to the planet. The, the more people who start to recognize that all there is is, it's funny, it's a song, all there is is love, <laughs> but it's it is the the more that becomes, at least more people become more open to that. The more I think, despite what's all the turmoil on the surface, the the there's this underlying foundation that's much more solid than than all the things that appear to be falling apart. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned the song, um, and that was interesting. I, I, I think you know what you said uh -huh. when you said the song. And the song title by John Lennon, All You Need Is Love. Yes. But I suspect if John was alive today, he would have, re he, he would have created a new song with the title you just said. All right, I, right. After I said, yes, he said, All You Need Is Love, but it's All There Is Is Love. Yeah. So Someone that, needs to write that song. <laughs> that, is the new, that is the new version of All You Need Is Love. Right, right, right. So it's quite beautiful. And, um, you know, I wanted to mention, if I may also, so, sure. you know, we have this, this I'm writing a book right now. It's called, um, uh, I won't say the subtitle, but it's called uh, No Light, No Art, No Art, No Life. Mm -hmm. And the reason, the way that that came about, and this points to what a, a couple of things that you, you said, Hale, that were really beautiful uh, explanations. Um, I was walking down the street one day near my home in Venice and uh, I was walking and I, I walked past someone's home and I could see into their living room and hanging on the wall was this gorgeous painting and it was very beautifully lit. And I stopped and I admired it. And it got me to thinking about, you know, the power of art to impact and transform. Yes. And I continued walking and then somebody rode past me on a bike and music was playing. And it's like, oh, I love that song. and I love that artist. And I'm kind of thinking about that. And I come to Abbott Kenny Boulevard and I'm walking down Abbott Kenny and uh, in a storefront, there's a television monitor. And of all things, it's playing a trailer from one of my all time favorite films. The film is being there starring. Peter yes, yes, Bowers. yes. And yeah. so I stop and I, I literally watch the whole trailer and then I keep walking and I'm thinking about, wow, how great film is as a transform, a vehicle to transform. So I'm starting to kind of go deep in myself, considering fine art and music and film and how important it is, how necessary it is. And then I have this shift where there's this realization and it's kind of like one of those duh type of realizations yes everything is art there isn't yes. anything that yes. isn't art the pavement is art the yes. sky is art the yes. architecture the the fine arts you know it's all art and i'm really deep in that hail and i'm starting to kind of lose myself you know i kind of i'm walking down the street but i stop and i'm just kind of really having this this inner experience of sorts yes and then all of a sudden I hear a voice that says, imagine if the creative artist disappeared. Unthinkable, unimaginable, unbearable. Uh -huh. oh. And for a moment, for a split second, I felt life without any type of art in it. And it was terrifying. Yes. And I came back and I wrote down the experience and it became the Gate Sutra. No light, no consciousness, no art. No art, no life. Yes, yes, Unbearable. yes. Unbearable. Yes, but you know what's really interesting when you said that? It, I, I heard something different. You, you, um, 
what if there is no artist, but not as a uh, or, or not as a loss, but as a tremendous gain? It, it relates back to what we were talking about earlier. The as you've you've experienced when you perform or when you're producing or when you're doing something you love, that that sep- sense of separate personality dies a little bit. And what it, that is what we're on some level in everything we do, I believe that's what we're looking for, whether we're artists or not. But artists actually live that more because they're willing to take more risks. They're reaching out more. They're trying to express their truth through whatever art form they're trying to express. Yeah. But they actually in my experience, not in a negative way, in a very positive way, the, the separate individual actually dies a little bit when they really are, when the artist disappears and there's just art, whatever the art form is. And so I, I believe that's also a, 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 another a, a very powerful invitation, not just for artists, but for everyone. For everyone. Because it is, it is indigenous to everyone's soul or spirit. It, it is who we are at the most fundamental, most basic level, by whatever name you choose to call it. Now, one thing I would, I would, I would clarify from my perspective. Yes. To me, it's not that a little part of the individual self dies. Um, I don't experience it that way. But I do experience that it recedes to the background. And that the creator by whatever name you choose to give it becomes more expanded, more, more, more the foreground. Yes. But I still sense, you know, yeah, John's there, but John, you know, the small John is actually taking the backseat to the bigger John, if you will. Yes. yes. Um, so there's a kind of a peaceful coexistence. There's a value of what some people refer to as witnessing. The yes. Photon. Um, yes, where there yes. is, you know, the dynamic self is is there in the background, and maybe even there's some thoughts going on or emotions or what have you. But that big self really include, you know, encompasses it. And oh, absolutely, it, absolutely. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I I didn't mean that as a denigration in any way of yeah. any Johns. Yeah, uh, it, it's more about. Again, try, trying to clarify what I said and to, to take off on what you said, I, I think what happens, the it, it goes from only this to and this. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, most of it, uh, and that's also where there's so much turmoil on the surface on the planet right now. It's <laughs> only this. No, it, it's only this. It's only this. And you're wrong for, for thinking it could be anything else. But when when we when when the when the personal perspective that we all feel locked into disappears even a little, it becomes more and more an and. It, it includes everything. It it includes every human experience and every form. Beautiful. So, is there anything else? Um, that you like to discuss or or share with the people we're having this conversation in front of? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess one thing because um, Katie, um, she asked me if there were any books I wanted to recommend, and I I just grabbed four thoughtfully. I grabbed four off from my book, one of my bookshelves, and. I just wanted to mention these titles. Sure, sure. Go right ahead. Your listeners are interested uh, in them. But I want to call attention to one book uh, called Creative Calling. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. The, the subtitle, Establish a Daily Practice, Infuse Your World with Meaning, and Succeed in Work and Life. Beautiful book. Uh, Chase Jarvis is the author. Uh-huh. Um, another one is by Tom Shadiak, the movie director. Uh-huh. Uh, I worked with Tom on his film, I Am, and he's done many, many films with Jim and various other people over the years. But he wrote this wonderful book called Life's Operating Manual. Uh, um, 
and he has these things in here called the Fear and Truth Dialogues. And it's it's a lovely book, uh, mm -hmm. and I recommend that. Um, another director that I worked with, in fact, I, I, I was uh, the executive director of the David Lynch College of Cinematic Arts. I think that name changed. Um, but he has a book called Catching the Big Fish, uh, Meditation, Consciousness, and Creativity. It's an extraordinary book and, you know, with insights that somebody, that David probably could only have. Uh, right. So vivid in his imagination and his exploration of unusual places. And then a, a book by Sean McNiff called Trust the Process, An Artist's Guide to Letting Go. And I think that this notion of letting go today in everyone's lives is so important uh, to our sustained happiness, if you will. Yes, yes. Well, you're preaching, you, as you know, you're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> now, those are intended for your listeners, not you. <laughs> well, I might enjoy them too. Who knows? Yeah, you might. <laughs> Who knows? But, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, you've been teaching meditation since 1976. I've been involved in the teaching of, of letting go yeah. since the same time. Well, meditation is yes, let go, right? That's absolutely true. They're the same yeah. thing. They're, they're, they all the the tools when when they do us as opposed to us doing them yeah. uh, have are, are are doing the same thing totally, yeah, absolutely, beautiful. totally doing yeah. the same thing. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, great. You don't have a website to share at the moment, do you, or anything like so, that? GateNation.org. Uh, will be up, I hope, within the next couple of months. We go live in the next couple of months. We're almost done with it. Okay. Um, Visioneering uh, website was taken down. We're renovating that. Um, and our Creative People website is up. Uh, that's our branding company. Uh, but it's only accessible through our Gate website. So both of those sites will be live soon. Visioneering mm -hmm. will be coming a little bit later. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. So... So I, I just want to thank you. It's been fun talking to you and exploring this. And I think people will find this fascinating and helpful, I hope. Thank you. And I enjoyed it, all of your comments. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed everything you said too. It's, it's just beautiful. And you know, I, I, something about this conversation was to me, it wasn't just you sharing how the people in the arts are wanting to help each other, uh, help the world, but I feel like, Everyone is an artist in their own right. Even if they're, whatever they're doing, they're, they're creating beauty. Yes. And that, you know, I, I didn't really comment on it at the time, but they're one of the, the, the indicators when you're recognizing that which you truly are is this feeling of beauty, this feeling of sweetness and beauty and love. And, you exude that, but but also it feels like everyone it, it, uh, finds it really exquisite to be participating in that however they can, no matter what their role is. And so it's an invitation to do that. I am so, that's wonderful. Thank you. And, and you know, I'm so fascinated by other people's uh, life, life stories because inevitably, it doesn't matter who uh, I am speaking with, I discover that in one form or another, they are artists, they are creators. Yes. And it's so interesting to hear um, the diverse ways that consciousness, the infinitely diverse ways that consciousness manifests itself through each of us. Yes. And, you know, it, it's become kind of cliche to say, you know, we are one, you know, <laughs> but, but the fact is many such expressions that, you know, may seem cliche through over usage at this moment in time yes. are actually really true. Yes. And when you, when you arrive at that experience, not just the understanding, but the experience, you really do see we are all one. And, you know, again, another one of those, those, those worn phrases, you know, we're all in this together. Well, yeah, it's true. We are. 
And I always come back to that when my mind starts to act up a little bit, maybe misbehave and yes, yes. maybe get an attitude about uh, like a Trump supporter. I don't support Trump, something like that. That's one of my things. Yes, you know, yes. I always have to look at that and, and, and allow it to settle back into silence where all of us are in oneness. Yes, and yes. I don't want to be in my mind where I create separations between yes. myself and other people. I don't yes, want to do yeah. it anymore. Yes. You know? And it's easier to not do it these days. Uh, and, and I love that. Uh, yes. and in fact, if we, if we have one more second, I want to also. Oh, no, no, it's no that. rush. Okay. I want to recommend to people to watch a movie called Free Trip to Egypt. Free now, Trip to Egypt. Okay. Free Trip to Egypt. This movie came out in 2019. I worked on it in 2019, 2020. And, um, the backstory is the, the, the gentleman who created the film uh, lives, lived in Canada. Uh, his heritage was Egyptian. He moved to Zurich, Switzerland, uh, became a businessman there, um, quite, quite successful. And um, he's on a spiritual path. And he started noticing more and more all of the things happening in the world. And it, he was concerned. And he felt like, I need to do something to help. And one day he was on a tram in Zurich and he had this epiphany and the epiphany was, I'm going to make a movie. And he had the idea for what that movie was. And he's never made a movie in his life. He got off the tram and then he put a team together and came to the United States to begin implementing the idea for the movie, put a crew together. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the basic idea is that he had he and various people working with him held up signs saying free trip to Egypt. But where he held those signs up was at Trump rallies, uh, places where, you know, conservative Christians uh, frequent um, other places where, you know, you, you may not, you know, want to hold up a sign that says free trip to Egypt. Yes, uh, because you'll you know you might be spat upon, you might be you know told Arabs go home that kind of thing. But um, Tarek, the creator, persisted. He had some glitches along the way, but he kept refining his approach. And little bit by little bit, people would stop and say, "What do you mean free trip to Egypt?" And Tarek proceeded to tell them, um, "I will pay all of your expenses uh, to go to Egypt and have a great time, <laughs> with one caveat." You have to agree to meet with Islamic Egyptian families and have conversation. And finally, after a period of time, he got a group of people to agree to go. They went and he paired them up. He paired each person up with uh, an Egyptian person or family. And what you see happening is this unfolding of all the boundaries of prejudice and other things that got in the way of their true experience of one another falling away. And in the end, everyone embracing and saying, I love you. Mm -hmm. This is what we need to do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> On a big scale. <laughs> On a very big scale. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with John Ross. You can learn more about John at GateNation.org. That's G-A-T-E Nation.org. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe so you can have immediate access to future episodes. Please give us a five-star rating and share it with the people you care about. If you'd like to learn more about my work, my mentor, Lester Levinson's work, and the Sedona Method, please visit www.sedona.com. As you explore our site, you learn the key to lasting happiness, success, peace, and emotional well-being. We have books, courses, events, and plenty of free material to explore. Again, go to sedona.com. That's S-E-D-O-N-A.com. Thank you for being here, and we'll catch you on the next episode of Letting Go and the Greatest Secrets.